course, this this lecture, and probably you've covered some of this in um, you know pr prior um, sessions as well. Um, but you know, implementation science um, is uh, very focused on you know something called implementation outcomes as as much as uh, and distinguished from health outcomes. Um, and so um, the point of this part of the session is is to begin to distinguish between the different types of outcomes used in implementation research, uh, to appreciate the relationship between implementation outcomes and uh, a conceptual framework, which I think you've also been um, introduced to as well, um, and to start to gain insights about how and why to choose um, implementation outcomes for your research. So, um, you always sort of have to start out by asking, you know, what is the implementation research question? So this is, it's a, it's a one word. It's not what is the research question in implementation science. It's what is the implementation research question. Um, and this is what um, helps distinguish um, implementation science also from, you know, program evaluation. You have a research question that you're trying to answer that relates to implementation and how it could inform implementation. Um, and it should inform implementation broadly with a degree of, you know, some degree of uh, potential for generalizability. Um, if, if it is an intervention related um, question or study, um, it, it's really important to take care and, and to adequately specify the intervention or the implementation strategy that, that you're studying. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Steph Baral also talked about it. Um, and um, implementation outcomes and their, as well as their potential determinants should really be considered and specified. Um, so um, these are some questions in one of your readings, um, the Peters et al. paper that, um, you know, help, help, help you begin to think about, um, you know, how to assess research designs um, and reports on implementation research. But I also think they're helpful to uh, have you think about like your own implementation research that you're uh, maybe planning. So implementation outcomes um, can be defined and, and distinguished, um, uh, conceptually distinct from health outcomes um, because they are the effects of deliberate um, and purposive actions to implement new treatments, practices, or services. So these are the things that that um, you expect your implementation activities to have a causal effect on, right? Um, so you, of course, you may expect your implementation activities to have an impact on health outcomes, but the difference is that the health outcomes can be influenced by many things besides the implementation um, that, that you're focused on. And so the implementation outcomes themselves are, are those things that are, are expected to be directly impacted by um, the implementation processes that you're putting in place or studying. They serve as impl indicators of implementation success or failure. They're proximal indicators of implementation processes. Um, and they're in intermediate outcomes to these more downstream um, outcomes like service outcomes, clinical outcomes, and population health outcomes. You choose these outcomes because your intent really is to get insights about the hows and whys um, regarding the effectiveness of interventions and the success and failures of implementation strategies in, in the real world. Um, and I would say also the, um, you know, the, the yeah, the, the success and failure of the implementation strategies as well. Um, this is a great um, schematic that, that really helps distinguish um, and lay out the, the conceptual distinctions between implementation outcomes, service outcomes, and client outcomes. Um, you know, as, as, as clinical researchers and as epidemiologists who don't do implementation research, often we are um, focused on, you know, client outcomes and health outcomes like mortality and, um, you know, uh, cure and things like that. Um, but in implementation research, we're focused on um, things like acceptability, adoption, feasibility, sustainability. Um, I know that these are terms that, that you um, have been introduced to before um, as part of this course and maybe as part of other work that you're involved in. 
Um, I guess, you know, the other thing that I wanna, uh, the other distinction I like to, to make on this slide and thinking about service outcomes, effectiveness, for example, it's, a, it's an outcome that we're also very uh, used to thinking about in terms of, you know, an interventions effectiveness. Um, you can have situations where you have two interventions that are aimed at, um, you know, having a, um, at, at, at treating or, or affecting change in a particular health outcome. One may be much more effective than, than the other, but they're both effective. You could have a situation where the less effective intervention actually has more impact in your clinic population um, or on a, 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 a target population in the community. And the reason that that would happen is because of of things like these implementation outcomes. The less effective intervention might be more acceptable, it might be more feasible, it might be less costly, um, and therefore you know, more scalable, more um, people may be more readily um, uh, engaged in the, in the intervention, um, in the less effective intervention, and, and that can be okay, can actually result in um, you know, superior outcomes. And so this is why we, we think about um, implementation outcomes um, in addition to some of the things like service outcomes and, and client outcomes. Um, I've included a table here from readings to, to that, that really sort of lays out some working definitions for implementation outcomes like these listed here. Um, I'm just conscious of the time and trying to move us along here. Um, what about choosing an implementation outcome? Um, your outcome choices, um, you know, they, they may be limited by your available data sources, but clearly you're going to be thinking about you know, your research questions in um, choosing your implementation outcomes. Um, they have to be related to things like uh, features of the implementation strategy and you know, what the level of implementation is happening. If it's an intervention that is focused on providers, then um, clearly you're gonna have some outcomes that, um, that are measured at the provider level. Um, it's also helpful if you have a conceptual framework that is you know, relevant to helping you with the process of implementation. Um, this is a very useful resource to, to help you identify and choose the right implementation outcomes to focus on. Um, and of course, there are other study um, and context specific considerations. Um, what I'm, I've, I've included here is an example from a, a recent proposal that um, an NIH proposal that we submitted um, that was um, it was a, a hybrid design. So it was measuring both implementation outcomes and um, health outcomes. And we delineated um, by aim in the proposal um, the uh, implementation outcomes, which data elements were being used to construct them, um, what the data sources were, um, and, and in some cases, which aspects of our conceptual framework, in this case, we were using both REAIM and CIFR conceptual frameworks, um, and we were mapping the outcomes, outcome choices um, to these frameworks. Um, it's helpful from an investigative standpoint to, to do this mapping and think it through, but it's also really important to help um, reviewers um, see your thought process and, and understand you know, how you uh, decided to operationalize your implementation out, how you chose and how you decided to operationalize your implementation outcomes. Um, and it also helps clearly distinguish the outcome types, in this case, implementation outcomes from, from health outcomes. Um, very important for implementation science studies to, to do this. Um, so the, the study I mentioned was the, the PROMISE study. We did have um, you know, a, a, a conceptual framework um, that informed our study design where we drew on both the REAIM framework and the CIFR frameworks. Um, and this was because we had, um, you know, they, we really did have um, a, a need for some of the strengths of each of these frameworks. And, um, and we justified the uh, choice of these frameworks uh, based on that. And then um, from these frameworks, we were able to really, I, I think, get some, um, make some good choices and justify the choices of implementation outcomes, which in our case were, 
program reach, quality of care, and sustainability. So um, some examples with implementation outcomes. So we, was there a question? Yes. So in terms of looking at the outcome, you know, and, and choice of outcome measures, um, uh, I mean, it, it seems to be that, that actually one of the biggest determinants, and this may be captured in, in your kind of study, you know, and con contextual considerations, but would be the amount of resources that you have to do the study um, and the time that you have to do the study. Um, so, so for example, I, I, I mean, you know, if you had limited time, you, you might not be able to look at, for example, sustainability, but you might be able to look at feasibility and acceptability. Because sustainability implies um, a certain period of time elapses after the intervention has been implemented, correct? Right. Um, I, I do think that um, in many cases, if you are doing research in a, um, in a routine service delivery setting, um, if you're if you're, if you're like IDEA and you're really just sort of um, relying on the observational data that are generated um, as part of that process, it's gonna be hard to measure um, some of these implementation outcomes. They, they usually require things like, um, you know, mixed methods approaches and primary data collection. And, um, and, and so, um, you know, qualitative focus group interviews, in-depth interviews, it really, you, you, uh, it's hard to get at some of these, um, you know, uh, some of these outcomes through the routine data collection that happens. On the other hand, you can also think about um, uh, some, of, some of them um, as possibly being generated through routine data. If, if you're implementing some kind of um, new, new policy and you see that at the provider level, um, you know, people are, are not adhering to it um, and that there's very low, um, compliance by providers, you can get at things like acceptability and feasibility. But for the most part, um, it, it's going to involve some different data collection than you're used to doing and, um, and, and, and some resources to go with it. Yeah, I think if that's if I got the question. Thank you. Um, so jumping into a few examples. So one example uh, I want to present is like what of what are the what's the uptake of screening and treatment for mental health disorders in routine HIV care or delivery settings in low and middle income countries? This is um, something that we we set out to do in the IDEA network. And then if there's time, um, I'll, I'll talk about like the kinds of outcomes that are appropriate for implementation of large scale initiatives um, like we have in the U.S. and like you're, we're seeing more globally, you know, ending the HIV epidemics. Um, so the IDEA network, as, um, as you may know, since I, I learned that everyone in the room is, is participating in the uh, Asia Pacific region, region of IDEA, I don't have to go into too much detail here, but it's, um, you know, uh, 2 million patients, more than 250 clinics, more than 40 countries where we have IDEA uh, participating sites. And um, as you also may know, um, we every few years, um, uh, Steph, Steph Duda and I um, co-chair the site assessment working group, and we do routine site assessments where we um, uh, administer sites uh, questionnaires about different aspects of what really relates to, uh, in, a, in a big way, to implementation, how, how programs are implemented, what are some of the features of programs, um, and, and how, how services are delivered at each of the sites. And so we've so far done three of these in IDEA, one in 2009, one in 2014, and, and the most recent one is 2017. We're gearing up for um, site assessment 4.0, which will be uh, going out in the field hopefully this summer. Um, some of the topics that we collect data on include, um, you know, information about uh, what, what type of facility it is, the level of the healthcare system, um, the patient population, staffing, the kinds of community linkages they might have, um, uh, what practices may be in place around art initiation or adherence support, um, laboratory and diagnostic services, um, and in recent years we've asked about mental health services and substance use services. 
at the sites. Um, and this, uh, again, you may, you, this is, is not, not uh, new for you, but you can see what the, the surveys look like. We have a paper version and we have a, a red cap version that people can complete electronically. Um, so what is the uptake and screen uh, of, uh, what is the uptake of screening and treatment for mental health disorders and routine HIV care? delivery settings in low and middle income countries. Um, we, we did a, a special um, site assessment around mental health um, and substance use and other non-communicable uh, non diseases um, recently. And, and so I'm gonna show you um, the results of, of those surveys. You can see here the, the regions that were represented and the countries as well. Um, I'm thinking you've seen this before, but this is from the Proctor paper in Implementation Science in 2013 that is really about you know, the need to specify uh, an implementation, um, to, to specify aspects of implementation. So name it, define it, and specify it. And then specifying, we're talking about things like the actor, the action, the action target, the dose, Etc. Um, this, you know, not only is important for replicability, so people can replicate um, some of the implementation and intervention um, research, but also for being able to synthesize research across, um, you know, different studies. Um, and so we tried um, to adhere to some of this in some of the measurement work that we did in the um, in the. Um, uh, me and measuring mental health screening, um, the, the, the capacity and existence of, of, of screening services, diagnostic capability, and, and uh, referral in, in some of our questions, which you can see here directly from the site assessment. Um, you know, when do you screen? Um, who do you screen? Do you have a written protocol? Um, and, you know, who is, is, is there, uh, you know, who, who does uh, management of depression, things like that. And so um, we were able to get an estimate of the extent to which um, there is available on-site management of depression um, across different settings, um, and the extent to which it is available off-site or just not available at all. And then getting into some of the details about what kinds of um, management or interventions might be uh, available and um, at, at each of the sites. And this was uh, in a paper by Angela Parsisepi that was uh, published in JIAS. Um, there were also questions about substance use related uh, education, screening, and referral. And um, she did another analysis, Angela did another analysis about whether or not um, this has changed over time. And this takes advantage of the fact that, um, you know, there were there are multiple waves of, of site assessments. And, um, and, and so you could see here a map that shows where um, sites and IDEA participated really only in one round of site assessments, the blue ones, or um, only in 2017, um, which are the, the purple ones, or in two waves, the 2014, 2015, and the 2017. So, so there is um, real opportunity here to look at how, um, services for substance use screening um, and management and referral have, have, have been changing over time. Um, another, uh, I think, unique feature of IDEA and that we can look at implementation outcomes um, at, at points in time from the site assessment, but we can also look at how they may be changing over time. And so um, this slide shows a table from um, this, this in, press, in, in uh, process publication that looked at the proportion of sites that had education on high-risk substance use behaviors and harm reduction practices in place on site in the 2014 to 15 period, as well as um, that same proportion in the 2017 period. So you can see you know, an increase in the prevalence of on-site education, an increase in the prevalence of screening for drug or alcohol use, um, and a slight increase of in prevalence of um, referral services for substance use treatment. Um, now, these are not necessarily the same sites. It's not taking advantage of the, the longitudinal nature of the site assessment data that I, I mentioned, but, um, but that was uh, 
an, an, another analysis that did take place. And it was possible to see, you know, with, in those sites where there were two time points um, where, where these implementation outcomes were measured, um, you can see the proportion that had education, screening, and referral available at both time points. What can happen at a site? A site can, you know, maybe, maybe um, not have it in place and then it becomes available. Uh, a site could have it in place and then it, it, does, it, it no longer uh, it stops being available. Um, it can be available at both time points or it could not be available at either time points. And so um, this is an analysis that really took advantage of the longitudinal nature of some of the implementation outcome data that, um, that, that we collect in the IDEA network. Um, and um, Angela leveraged this, um, th th these data um, and these analyses um, to, to support uh, a K proposal that is linked to IDEA where she is now examining, um, in addition to looking at health outcomes, uh, mental health and substance use disorders on, on, and their influence on key HIV treatment outcomes, um, she's also beginning to look at some of the um, implementation outcomes like modifiable patient provider and health facility barriers and facilitators to integrating evidence-based mental health and substance um, uh, disorder interventions into HIV care. Um, and yeah, to give you an idea, she's uh, um, gonna be doing in-depth interviews at three HIV clinics and then more site assessment uh, surveys um, to, to get at what's going on with um, implementation around Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that, th that next survey about implementation gaps will be informed by some of this other work that she's doing. Um, another example, um, looking at some implementation outcomes relates to uh, TB diagnostic capacity. This was a, a, a survey that we did, a site survey that we did uh, quite a long time ago um, at PEPFAR supported clinics in the ICAP program. Um, and I like uh, this example. Well, it looked at the, the uh, diagnostic capacity of, um, uh, um, of clinics looking at the different types of, of, um, of tests that they had available on site. And I like to show this analysis um, because, not only because it documents the, uh, the, the capacity by different site characteristics, um, overall, we saw that 87% of sites surveyed had, um, you know, the, the gold standard of sputum spear microscopy, but also some of these other, um, other tests. But also we could look at, um, because we had information about the, the number of patients that were being served at each of these sites, we could say, well, yeah, 87% of the sites have sputum spear microscopy, but it covers 97% of the patients. And, and that's because a lot of the sites in, in the uh, study were rural sites that um, you know, had fewer patients. And so it's useful to think about coverage. Um, and then this is an example of how we could sort of get at that. Um, yeah, I guess I have a little bit of time. Um, this is a, a, another example of um, implementation outcomes. I'll just go through quickly, but it was a, a hybrid type one trial that was assessing the impact of group versus individual antenatal care on maternal and income, uh, uh, maternal and infant outcomes in, in Malawi. Um, and they did a really nice job um, at like describing their outcomes um, according to the different hypotheses um, and when they were measured and things like this. So I, I think it's a nice example um, for, for um, folks to, to look at, including some you know, knowledge related outcomes, um, the health outcomes are there. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, so, so this is an um, example of how implementation outcomes can be measured alongside health outcomes as part of, a, as part of an experimental study. Um, and this was uh, another study that was um, a hybrid type three effectiveness study, which as, as you probably know from Steph Burrell's lectures, that um, you know, this is more emphasizing implementation outcomes over health outcomes. Um, 
And so they were interested in sort of understanding the extent to which um, an implementation facilitation um, intervention um, could improve the likelihood of, um, of starting buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder in the emergency department. Um, and this is their, uh, their study protocol paper. I think the, um, the uh, results paper is not out yet, but um, they, they, they do also a very good job at distinguishing the implementation outcomes from the health outcomes. Um, and so you can see the primary implementation outcome compares the baseline evaluation and IF um, evaluation period, intervention period on the proportions of provision of ED initiated buprenorphine with referral for ongoing opioid uh, use disorder treatment. And so um, it was not necessarily a health outcome, but it was more like the referral as the outcome, the implementation outcome in this case. Um, and again, great job of distinguishing between you know, their, their implementation outcomes where you can see things like fidelity, um, number of clinicians providing ED initiated buprenorphine um, and their effectiveness outcomes, which were more secondary in this case. Um, and I just wanna say a few things about, um, you know, this, this sort of issue of outcomes and metrics for some of the large scale initiatives that we're seeing uh, around ending the epidemic, um, certainly in the U.S., but not only. Um, you know, a lot of fast-track cities have, have very ambitious targets, um, and increasingly we're hearing jurisdictions talking about ending, ending HIV epidemics. And my, my real um, point here is to just, um, you know, taking a look at what, what's going on here in New York. We have, um, we have articulated in New York State, you know, many different outcomes, mostly health-related outcomes um, that and specified targets for the um, initiative to achieve. Most, most, most important one that um, our, our state is focused on is reducing HIV incidence. Um, but there are also some, you know, you know many other uh, outcomes, health outcomes that um, the initiative is focused on. Um, I think what we're missing in New York, and I and I also fear will be missing in um, the larger national initiatives, implementation initiatives aimed at ending HIV epidemics, um, is that you know they 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 don't they have the population health outcome metrics um, tied to their overarching initiative goals, but often missing a lot of information that, or maybe completely devoid of any implementation metrics that sort of reflect, um, you know, the analogy of what we've been talking about um, in, in, in um, earlier part of this, this talk around um, the need to, to, to track the precursors, the things that, that are being deployed as specific implementation strategies that are intended to result in the achievement of these um, overarching initiative goals. So, um, so we, need, we need to think about um, we need to get to a place where these large scale initiatives are thinking not only about the health outcomes, but the implementation outcomes that are so important to um, documenting the success or failure of, of these large scale implementation efforts. Um, and I, I, was, I recently published a, a piece on this in AJPH um, to, to talk about how, um, you know, ending epidemics is really a, such a different um, such a different um, activity compared to the, the control efforts that we've had in place for HIV, um, epidemic control efforts, that um, we really need to revisit the metrics that we use to, to, uh, to track it and also to be thinking about um, you know, how we implement. And, and the implementation can also drive or worsen disparities. And so um, I also make a case about the importance of tracking disparities metrics, not just for health outcomes, but also in implementation outcomes. So access to PrEP, for example, and PrEP prescribing is um, you know, very different um, depending on socioeconomic status and race ethnicity in the US. 
And so um, those disparities in implementation outcomes will uh, result in driving disparities in population health outcomes as well. Um, yeah, I think I've pretty much said um, a lot of this stuff already, but just to recap, um, implementation research really includes a focus on both implementation outcomes and health outcomes, um, not only health outcomes, sometimes only implementation outcomes, um, but ideally both. Um, implementation outcomes should really think about measuring the actual targets of specific implementation strategies. Um, so what, what are we trying to achieve through implementation? Um, so the uptake of the intervention, the provider behavior related to the intervention delivery, these are implementation outcomes, um, examples of implementation outcomes that you can consider. Um, these implementation outcomes are often not explicitly considered or pre-specified, but without their specification and measurement, um, it's difficult to understand a major goal of implementation science, which is to elucidate the how and why of the effects of implementation um, or, or lack thereof. If we don't see an effect on health outcomes of an intervention or an intervention strategy, is it because the intervention is not effective, effective or the strategy is not effective, or is it because it was not implemented as designed, as intended? Um, and this also gets at, you know, not only just no effect, but why, why was there only a modest effect or an effect that was much weaker than what we might have expected? Um, measurement of implementation outcomes can, um, you know, give important insights and answers to some of these questions. And when choosing implementation outcomes, um, your outcome choices should be driven by several factors or considering several factors, including the research questions, what data you have available to you, whether you have resources to collect more data, um, features of the strategy and the level of implementation that's happening, um, a conceptual framework or maybe more than one conceptual framework, um, as well as other study and context specific considerations. Uh, and I leave you here with just a couple of um, references and resources, some of which were in your readings. And um, we've been trying to build um, a, a resource on our website that is specifically focused on um, implementation science as it relates to population health. Um, the link here. <clears throat> 